So I just want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting us to uh, speak at this panel discussion. I think the aim of this discussion, it's a 20 minutes quick fire discussion. Um, we'll have questions from the audience as well, and I'll, I'll have some questions as well. Um, on the panel, we have two uh, folks here. Um, Hardy Kajimoto from uh, Helios and uh, Dave Smith from Lonza. I'll give an opportunity to introduce them briefly. Um, but just as a, a sort of a starting point for this panel discussion, I think those who attended the uh, Japanese Doing Business in Japan workshop heard lots of very interesting progress in Japan. Um, clearly led by, um, from the highest le uh, level, Shinzo Abe setting out a very clear vision for cell therapy and how that's being executed. I thought for this panel discussion, we'll have a slightly different perspective of the folks in the trenches, almost the bottoms up of mm. the benefits, challenges, and opportunities in Japan. So sort of just to overlay with the high level strategic perspectives that Toda-san and Suzuki-san um, uh, spoke about earlier. So I'll just hand it over to the panel, perhaps just to introduce yourselves and just to highlight um, some of the activities that you're doing in Japan specifically that would be relevant for this discussion. So Hardy, would you like okay. to start? Yeah. So my name is Hardy Kagimoto. Now I'm running uh, Helios, which is a public company. We brought the Helios public three months ago. So our primary focus is to utilize iPS cell-derived um, RP cells. And we have just implanted uh, world first clinical research using iPS cells one year ago. And then we are trying to move it forward for, to obtain approval in 2020 in Japan and starting trial in the US too. Okay, thank you. And Dave? Um, Dave Smith with Lonzo. Uh, we've had a presence in Japan for a number of years through a sales organization. But in 2013, we, we become very aggressive in the regenerative medicine, working with uh, companies and institutions in Japan we, we focused on developing uh, GMP, IPS, Xeno-free banks. We delivered the first ones this year. Um, and also, probably more important, it, this year we did a licensing agreement with Nikon. Nikon will own and build a facility in, in Tokyo. It will be use Lanza operating documents and quality systems, and we will collaborate to form a, a very strong uh, CMO in Japan. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Hardy. So I'll, I'll kick off with the first question. Um, from the workshop yesterday in Japan, it was clear that a lot of partnerships are happening between um, US, Europe, and Japan. Um, so I just want to get your perspectives of outside looking in from Dave's point of view and, and inside looking out from Hardy's point of view of the, the rationale and the importance of these types of partnerships and what drove um, those types of partnerships and the, and the reason the business objectives. Um, perhaps Dave, if you want to start on that. Um, we saw Japan as the, the great growth engine for regenerative medicine. It gives you that, it gave us the base because of the new regulatory pathways to get our clients there quickly. Um, that's why we, we saw that we needed to have a manufacturing site to move there. So we started um, working with partnerships with some of the companies, building relationships. Um, we've been working with Hardy for uh, about three years now, and these relationships help us get to the point where it made sense to build a facility in Japan. Yep. Hardy? So from my point of view, there. Well, so I should speak about. Uh, well, what, what I can see from Japan side. Okay. So we have science, great sciences, but um, historically we are very weak with commercialization. And uh, everyone's everyone discussed about the death valley, right? It's, it's, it's a common issue. But um, especially in Japan, for example, we did not have um, GMP certified, globally recognized uh, CMO, such as Monza. So that's a clear infrastructure we need to bring our technology from Japan to outside of Japan and also bring innovations from outside to Japan. So that's something we, um, we need, is that some uh, uh, David is working on. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of commercialization, Japan is such a small country and then we have a very close network. And uh, whether you are in it or not, that's the mm -hmm. that's the crucial part. That's why I think Toda-san is promoting the um, network is very key. That's mm -hmm. why FAM is um, promoting those uh, collaboration mm -hmm. scheme. Okay, excellent. And you touched upon the manufacturing side. So clearly, with the 
uh, regulatory framework there. Mm -hmm. uh, the hope is and the objective will be that more and more therapies come to market. Um, this potentially will create bottlenecks elsewhere, these early days. So how do you talk about the manufacturing mm -hmm. component of it? Uh, from a GE point of view, we often look at that, and I've been speaking and working with Japan for a couple of years now, trying to understand that dynamic. Do you feel that Japan is, uh, I mean, now they've opened up to CMOs now and more um, permissible, but is there still a gap in what's required from a manufacturing capability perspective, either capacity or capability? Uh, that piece is not yet clear. Um, the, with, I think Japan, Japanese government has decided to be part of um, uh, uh, PICS, which European is using. Yep. But um, whether those regulations will be globally aligned or not, that's, that's just still questionable. That's the yeah, remain to be answered. And I, I think the way we see it right now is it's a gap in, in trained personnel. Um, it is, it's a, a very big bottleneck in really even starting up the first facility. To find the, a pharmaceutical trained quality head or a operations head is, is a, a very big challenge today. I think that there is a great opportunity for, for training programs and development programs where we can bring these people forward and that will allow the industry to grow, the, the manufacturing the, and the pharmaceutical industry right. it, to grow very rapidly in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's probably not an issue only for Japan. If I look globally as well, there's a, a dearth of talent in terms of GMP or high quality manufacturing from cell therapy. So um, I think it's a, sort of a, a global trend, but maybe even more so in Japan, given the regulatory framework and the uh, requirements to pull in uh, uh, manufacturing. Um, I've got some more questions here, but I just wanted to open up to the floor if there are any questions around some of the initiatives in Japan and the execution part of it, if anyone's got any questions around that. Okay, I'll just carry on with some questions. If people have, please, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll go to you and uh, we can uh, discuss those. Um, so, there were two... Um, therapies that have got this conditional approval uh, that were mentioned recently, uh, through own atherosis, which I think is great, they're moving through and clearly a major milestone in the process. But then, at least from where I look at it as well, especially for startup companies, getting approval is the first part, and we learned that from Dendron, you can get improve, uh, approval. But then the second part around reimbursement, how, who pays for it and how that goes through. Um, I wonder if you've got any perspectives of, uh, I, I know information is limited um, to date in Japan, but from your perspectives as well, how you see that either being a, a challenge or an opportunity or, or something that needs to be figured out. Uh, because um, as I said, there needs to be an ROI there and reimbursement's key and, and, and what would that look like? So. Yeah, so from my point of view, the regulation is great. Really great. So as a startup, we have uh, RDA uh, access to the market. Mm -hmm. So potentially we should have a higher return on investment, which uh, investment uh, return we can reinvestment to the new pipelines, and that's the whole concept of this new regulatory strategy. But then the question comes back, always comes back to pricing, reinvestment, and we plan to develop our technology starting from Japan and expand it globally. What if if we have lowest price tag in Japan first? with the influenced uh, US pricing and European pricing. And that can be the case. If that can be the case from global companies, is there any reason to start the trial in Japan? And that's gonna kill the whole concept of this regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. So again, the reinvestment is a key, and I'm keen to watch what kind of price tag JCS is going to get, yeah. and also Telmo is going to get that's going to send a signal to the global pharmaceutical company or regional company like us whether Japan is really serious to make it happen or not. Interesting. And I would add it's going to be very interesting because you're talking about very di diverse, you know, we say regenerative medicine, but they're very diverse. Right. You saw even a, a Toto-san's slide was uh, there was a tissue engineered products, there were um, stem, straight stem cell, uh, allogeneic stem cells, and then we start talking about iPS cells, which have probably the most 
um, challenging uh, manufacturing process of, of any of them. Right. You know, and finding a, a reimbursement for regenerative medicine as a whole will be an interesting to see how it shakes out. Absolutely. I mean, uh, just to add to that point, anecdotally, I was speaking to many um, stakeholders in Japan, and um, around that cost sensitivity element, for example, anecdotally people say, well, Dendrion uh, Provenge would never get reimbursement in uh, Japan uh, because of that price sensitivity, which might suggest that autologous therapies may have challenges there. So uh, I know, Hardy, you mentioned about the pricing and setting prices globally, but do you think there's a potentially a higher sensitivity? Uh, does that, that, that sort of mean that there's going to be a higher price sensitivity in Japan? Uh, I think it's possible. The, we have the highest growth rate of elderly population in Japan to start with. And on paper, we state the uh, pricing of the product will be decided on, on, on uh, cost of goods. Mm -hmm. But what if, if the cost of goods is so high, which doesn't really justify the clinical benefit? Yeah. Uh, the approval system itself is depending on whether we can, sh we can show statistical significance or not. So it's separate from pricing system. Right. So that can be potential issue in Japan. Right. Yeah. Any additional comments on your side, David? Uh, I guess I would use the example of mm. the autologous IPS program. Um, awesome. We've done basic yes. numbers on that, and manufacturing costs could be between three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars per manufacturing cost. Mm. Three and five hundred thousand. So, if you would talk in normal reimbursement, you'd be well over a million. Right. F to make it reasonable, which you know, as you said, possible, not possible. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I mean, uh, Gil said yesterday about trying to make the case for health economics, mm -hmm. um, but if it's tied to cost of goods, that's a very different uh, dynamic, I guess, on, on how you're gonna price these things. Yeah. Um, the other question I had is um, pharma companies in Japan, large pharma companies. So. GE's been in the biologics monoclonal antibody space for a long time, and one of our observations is that Japan, very successful in small molecule drugs, to a certain extent hasn't been fully ingrained with the biologics revolution. Um, I'm sure Lonza has perspective of that, perhaps with Shugai being one exception to that. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you think they will be involved or not involved or participate in the cell therapy space? Because um, I guess there'll be a, sort of a, a key stakeholder. We have in the US, for example, companies like, well, a European US, Novartis, for example, driving things um, for immunotherapy. So any, any perspectives on how Big Pharma in Japan would uh, yeah, so I think we should look, look back to the history of protein therapeutics. Uh, some of the pharmaceutical companies in Japan started some of the activities early on, but um, was not quite successful, and mainly because um, by nature they didn't have much appetite for innovation or risk. But um, I think the situation is slightly different now. Um, Probably because Shinya Yamanaka invented IPS cells in Japan and probably because government is pushing it so hard and the atmosphere is more favorable at this moment. And for example, we have, uh, we have closed a deal with Daniel Sumitom Pharmaceutical. They are willing to move cell therapy field forward, which is very helpful. And also Fujifilm bought CDI, yeah. uh, which is a great sign, a uh, great signal that they are committed in the sales space. Mm -hmm. So I think the uh, environment will keep on moving forward in that direction, and then hopefully uh, we can lead some of the therapeutic field. Yeah. yeah. And Lonza, you've clearly been involved with the biologics for a long time, yeah, and then yeah. now uh, the cell therapy. Are you seeing that uh, how pharma's gonna interact with that in Japan? Uh, as you said, we come from a long line of biologics. Japan has not really moved towards microbial mammalian to a great extent, but you, we're seeing much more activity in the, in the regenerative medicine side. Um, interest, they're still trying, I, I would say they're still in the um, exploration, you know, they're, they're talking to people, they're having partnership discussions, and more importantly, you're seeing a lot of um, companies who are looking to develop tools for the regenerative medicine area that that are very that is outside of their normal scope. 
Um, you know, so you're seeing these companies investing and moving forward, not just on the, the product side, but also on the equipment tool side, which is very interesting to see. And is that because that they could integrate the tools and technology, make it like a, a classroom medical device sort of thing, or because they need to figure out ways to, to manufacture what they need at the end of the day? Um, we believe at this point that they will take a lot of the manufacturing base. I mean, that's one of the reasons we'll, we're working with Nikon is they will take their, their optic skill, they will take some of their isolation skills that they have, mm. they will actually integrate it and, and move forward into kind of taking our systems and improving on our systems, and it will be a back and forth flow. Right. So we think that some of the automation base and some of the, the technology that will come out of Japan <laughs> will make regenerative medicine more cost effective across the globe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can, can I make one of course? Um, I think historically Japan is strong once, um, once the policy is aligned. Uh, but when we have to f you know, face innovation, we don't show uh, its strengths. Right. Um, Toyota did well. Um, they have companies, no subsidiary companies, or related companies, thousands of companies around Toyota. Uh, then they're going to keep on innovating technologies for their purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think now Japan is kind of forming those type of, type of the structure led by the government. So I have a hope that we'll be able to come up with a very good healthy industry from Japan uh, once we have this aligned uh, structure in place. Right, right. Um, we talk about Japan. One of my remits is Asia as a whole. In the big markets I kind of see are Korea, Japan, mm -hmm. and China. Um, lots of um, uh, complexities in working. How would you see Japan being um, uh, a player in the wider arena? So we very much focus on Japan for Japan, but how, how do you see that as a global player, either as a manufacturing hub or a center of clinical um, data points, if you like. Um, maybe Dave, you want to kick yeah. off with that one? Um, I think we have a starting to go there, which is, I think that from an equipment standpoint, from a development standpoint, automation, they're going to really help drive the re regenerative medicine. So I think from those, those opportunities are there. Also, the Japan regulations align very well with EMEA. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you will see that you can become a, a strong manufacturing hub particularly to Europe because of, of location it would work. China's a little a, a bigger question, but I think the, to get into the big markets, I think uh, Japan becomes a manufacturing expertise area. Mm -hmm. And the question will, will be if the approvals start in Japan, will they be able to reference in other countries? Yeah. You know, will uh, Canada become a reference country, Australia, um, Switzerland, some of the, the natural reference companies, right. countries. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's no way Japan can compete with labor costs. So we should find a yeah. <laughs> way where we can really compete. Yeah. But I think those are the areas, and uh, I think you know, uh, same as I, I like to use the analogy of the car industry. But um, I think we find our strengths in um, modifying stuff and come up with the best way to solve some of the issues. That's what we're good at mm -hmm. historically, and uh, I think that characteristic can be well, <coughs> well utilized for regenerative medicine. Right. There are thousands of ways to induce cells, thousands of ways to uh, come up with 2D automated cell culture system. That's where we can show our strength in the long, long term. And taking that hub concept as well, I presume that's only really going to work for allogeneic therapies, right? So Mesoblast, mm -hmm. for example, in Singapore, we'll use that as a uh, allogeneic hub, potentially Japan or others, but I'm guessing it'll only work for allo products, autologous IP, they'll have to just be within Japan as an example. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. Well, the, both pathways viable depending on the product. When, yeah. you, when we talk about autologous IPS, it's hopeless. <laughs> so mm -hmm. We have to be the right technology for the right indication. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Last few seconds, Manit, is there any other questions? from the audience. Okay, I'll take the silence as a no. We're up for time. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll pass you on now to the next speaker. Thank you.